If you want to live up to your full potential, plot your best career, and positively impact every scene in your work story, read this book right now. This is a quote from Rami Newman, president and co-founder of Fairy God Boss. When media maven Deborah Burns wrote her award-winning memoir, Saturday's Child, life took a very unexpected turn. Suddenly, that creative journey revealed something original and exciting about the world of work. This is why it was such a surprise, totally different ends of the spectrum. Today, Deborah is going to show us how to apply the thought process of a writer that will spark new ideas and approaches, improve your questioning and creative problem solving, and empower you to take the reins of the career you'd like to live. As you can see, the next 30 minutes is going to be packed full, and I am so happy to have Deborah burns on never ever give up hope have you ever felt like giving up quitting throwing in the towel welcome to never ever give up hope featuring carol graham she's an author health coach and motivational speaker backed into a corner multiple times in her life Carol shares with you stories on how she overcame some of the toughest obstacles a person can go through in life, but refused to give up hope. Rather than admit defeat, an opportunity was presented, and it involves each and every one of you. Carol will feature spectacular guests who will share their messages of hope, encouragement and their inspiration to prove why life's adversities only make you stronger and now welcoming the host of the show here's carol graham well carol oh well <laughs> big uh intro and thank you for pulling one of those quotes uh when i first read uh, that one in particular, um, it just validated this whole twisting journey I've been on. And uh, thank you for that intro and very happy to be here with you today, Carol. Well, we have a lot of ground to cover and I'm so excited. First of all, let me say that I absolutely love um, cover of your book, Saturday's Child. When the audience sees it in the show notes, they will too. It's just, it, it, it tells a story through the picture. That it does, yes. And many things in our individual lives, it was completely unexpected. Uh, it was a publisher suggestion and I had a very different cover uh, in mind. Um, the story is about my unconventional, larger than life, otherworldly beautiful mother and our relationship. And in my mind, the cover was her face, oh, that face. Cool. And the publisher had other ideas. And I said, well, all right, I'll take a look at them. And I, I didn't like any of them. And then I opened the file of the cover that you're talking about. And I had one of those, oh, my God, <laughs> moments. Not only does it look uh, just like her, it's a stage cover, of course, but it, it, it looks just like her, but it tells the story, which yes, is what the yes, publisher exactly. wanted. It's the two of us, me as this little wistful girl sitting in a car with this elusive uh, woman, each of us alone together, but alone in our own worlds. And it just spoke volumes. So thank you for noticing yes, that. Yes, definitely. Now, as a media chief innovation officer turned founder and award-winning author, mm -hmm. Deborah Burns' story has mm -hmm. always been about invention and reinvention. She's lived those two key words with brands and clients throughout her entire career, and she's lived them in a life full of more twists and turns than she can tell. So tell us a little bit about 
your early years and what you just shared um, a smidgen about your mom and then what led you to be an author okay uh, well the the early childhood years I was the only child of that uh, glamorous uh, goddess uh, that I just described who I just described and uh, I worshipped and danced around her pedestal uh, my whole life and she was an ordin an extraordinary woman who was living an ordinary life and that was something uh, that I understood as the person who loved her most mm -hmm. and it was a guiding force in my life and I use the word elusive um, she might have been a tad narcissistic and I was always chasing uh, her love and that also set a tone uh, for my life. And when she died, uh, when I was in my uh, early 30s, she left a void that was never really quite filled. Mm -hmm. And more than 20 years later, uh, I had risen in my magazine career uh, some of which she saw the early stages of, but most of it she missed. And it was a career that was filled with those twists and turns and new roles and, and responsibilities that kept me kind of uh, fresh and new and always thinking and always inventing something. And some of those roles were in marketing, um, some of those roles were in sales. And when you enter that sphere and you're responsible for creating the ideas that generate all the revenue, it kind of wires you to think a certain way and be at your um, best or optimal performance. Uh, but as many of us no, even those of us who weren't in that industry, the magazine world, the publishing world has changed dramatically. And I don't know if any of you still read magazines, um, but I'm sure you remember them. And I worked for the company that produced brands like L. Um, I was the chief brand officer for the interiors magazines, L Decor and Metropolitan Home. I was the publisher of L Girl, the teen spinoff of L. So when publishing was flush, it was a wonderful uh, world and it was full of opportunity um, and new challenges. Um, and then it wasn't. It kind of looked its digital future in the eye and didn't know what to say next. And the world began to implode. And in this time period, as I said, more than 20 years after her death, I knew that I was going to have to reinvent myself. I had become chief innovation officer and it was still not enough to save the company that was rapidly uh, changing. And so it sold to a larger publishing company. And I knew I couldn't keep doing what I had been doing, that mm. I was going to have to change. As a part of figuring out what to do next, I realized that there was also some reassessing now as a full-fledged adult on that relationship from so long ago. That kind of parallel path of what am I going to do next from a career point of view and how do I reflect on this woman and this relationship that shaped who I am so that I can better plan or plot what I'm going to do next. If I have a deeper, more real understanding of what went on between us and how that molded me, 
maybe there are answers in there. And so I just dug deep. I got struck by the notion to write about my mother. It had never entered my mind until Mm. then. Um, I was actually in a museum. It's a very long story. We only have 30 minutes, uh, so I (laughs) won't go into it now. But I was looking at portraits of unconventional women from the 18th century, no less, and all of a sudden being open, I think, to uh, reflection and to possibility, uh, in came this idea that I would learn more about these women and the threads between them. I would write about my mother. And Hmm. that sent me down a seven-year creative journey as I launched my own consulting business rather than working for someone else again. Mm -hmm. I, I became the chief innovation officer of me. And I began this process of creating this book. Um, And I had to learn a tremendous amount because even though I was a journalism major in college, even though I was wired, as I said, for the marketing expression, uh, that's a very different type of writing. So even though I had that capacity, it is not the same as writing and unfolding a story for the reader in a way that the reader can jump in, see themselves, and understand the relationship. And so I needed to learn a lot. Uh, There were many fits and starts. I just took inspiration and stayed open. And the journey took me many different places, again, I, I'm a little familiar with your story, Carol, and so I know that the podcast has led you many places that you never expected. And that's what happens when we step into the unknown, which is what you need to do when you're working on a creative uh, venture. The book started out as a novel, a historical novel, no less. It was set in the 18th really? century. <laughs> yes. Uh, it had a different title. Um, it distanced um me from the actual story um, by putting us uh, in a whole other century. And then through these twists and turns, a literary agent said to me when she heard the the real story, you know, you should consider a memoir. And I hadn't up until that point. And once she said that, it was that same kind of light bulb moment that I had that meant Um, financially, my clients, because I knew that the time for this to happen was right now. I had never taken off any time um, in that uh, long career. And I I said to my husband, I need a year, which turned into two years almost. Um, And I did nothing but write this book seven days a week. Uh, It took about 15 months. And I, um, Therapeutic, I bet. Oh, my God. M- more like emotional torture. But yes, uh, therapeutic, cathartic. And it was full of revelations that I honestly, if I hadn't written the book, I, I wouldn't be in this place of understanding that I am today. Who would enjoy your book? Now you said a place of understanding and I understand that it obviously has a message and it's also a story. So which is it more? Is it a story? Is it a novel? Or does it it reads like a novel? Okay. It it reads like a novel, but it happens to be a true story. But it Um, also has a message and that message is? Well, the the message, um, that first I'll answer the reader part. Um, this is about a mother-daughter relationship. It's a unique one, but it's written in a way where there's no judgment, no malice, no resentment. I wanted readers to see and feel and love my mother. I could understand why I loved her uh, and still do uh, the the way I did. And then um, 
because there's no judgment in the book, what I have learned from readers is that they're able to insert themselves into the story and compare certain situations to what they may have gone through or certain feelings. So I would say every woman may not be a mother, but every woman is a daughter. I think the the people who respond to this book are uh, women of all ages, but I'd say the, the sweet spot is probably um, 35 to, to 50. Men seem to surprisingly uh, read the book. They don't buy it, but when they're married and their wives have it <laughs> and talk about it, they read it. And, and what I didn't expect is that men relate to it because so many of them felt pressure by their fathers, athletic pressure, okay. um, or if their fathers were big successes, uh, that they had to follow in their footsteps. And this sort of larger than life uh, persona that my mother had um, is something that, that men uh, relate to. As far as the second part of your question, what is the message? At the end of the day, and maybe this is why I'm on this podcast of your own creation, it is a story of hope and optimism. Every single one of us, to varying degrees, uh, has issues from their childhood. Very few uh, come out completely unscathed. <laughs> and we carry these wounds with us. And these wounds affect our interactions, affect our thought process, um, our decisions. And sometimes we're partially aware and sometimes we're completely unaware of those motivating uh, factors within us. My response to hardships. Um, in this particular case, it was never for me. Uh, it was not feeling uh, fully loved or as if I was a priority to her. That's a complication in that essential mother-daughter relationship. That was my wound. You may have another one, but I look at it in a positive way in the sense that I needed this mother to become who I am today. That's right. That we needed to be together to heal something in each other. When I wrote the book, it was also very important for me as part of this novel-esque kind of story to look at the forces that shaped the woman who then shaped me. That is critically important to understanding and to reframing in many ways. I heard Oprah talk recently, and ironically, because she had a, a big a mother-daughter problem. I'm not going to tell her story now. It's pretty public. Um, but she, too, said my own words and feelings back to me when she said her she always wished for a different mother and as her mother was dying she realized she was the mother that she needed to be who she was it is a truism and it is soul lifting when you look at it that way because Many of us carry these burdens with us, and it is a way to shift your perspective so that you can release and, and live up to the potential inside of you. Well, that's quite the message. Listening to you talk about it, it's also obviously quite the story. And as you were sharing different aspects of the book, I began to realize that this book just as you said some men appreciate it would definitely be a must read for for anyone that has a mother mm. and <laughs> yes <laughs> because yes. I think it would bring 
you know, my mother died when I was uh, a teenager. And so as you were talking, I was relating that too, in that how special the time with her is. And I think that that is, even though you might not appreciate her when she was here, your appreciation and what you become as a daughter and possibly a future mother has a lot to do with that initial relationship of mother-daughter. So there were many things that I thought about and I'm excited and ready to read your book. So thank you for sharing that. But we're going to take a short break and when we come back, we're going to have something so exciting, motivating, challenging to share. And that is Deborah Burns' new book, you don't want to miss this. We'll be right back. Carol Graham would like to show you the path from misery to miraculous triumph in her fast-paced memoir, Battered Hope. She relates her determination to succeed as someone who experienced one horrendous nightmare after another. Gang raped and left for dead, loss of a child, husband falsely imprisoned, and cancer. Nothing could break her tenacity or faith. No matter what you face, heartache, loss, suffering, or injustice, Carol will illustrate how she became a victor the same way you can. The secret is to never, ever give up hope. Order your copy at Amazon or batteredhope.blogspot.com. In your new book, you challenge us to think like a writer. Now, I never thought of that until I read it, what you said. And as I read it, I think I read it like three times. Okay, how does a writer think? Okay, how does a writer think? Okay, <laughs> how does a writer think? And I was intrigued. And as I looked at your book and looked at, you know, the reviews and what you share, oh my goodness, this is going to make a huge impact on, in many people's lives. And so please share about your book, Authorize It. Well, thank you uh, for that intro as well. But since you, you asked about Saturday's Child first, writing that first book and learning, as I said I needed to do, and immersing myself in the world of storytelling for the first time, I learned kind of these secrets or this wisdom that all writers knew because it's there for the taking. There are more tools and books about how to write better beginnings, middles and ends and character development and all of this that every good writer knows but 98% of the people are not going to write a book and they don't have access to it in the same way. Uh -huh. And okay. that was a light bulb moment for me. When I was out talking about Saturday's Child, because I have a business background, there were people I knew in the corporate world who were kind of intrigued by this creative journey and this business mind and, and in staying at it. If you had asked me two years ago, what are you going to be doing next? I knew that I had to return to my, my main career, uh, but I was changed by having done this, this uh, creative endeavor and living life as a creative. And I Going back to what I did before and solving other people's uh, business problems, like, mm -hmm. it just didn't suit me anymore. I wasn't sure what I was going to do next, but I kind of just stayed at it every day. I wrote an article where I had to give leadership advice. And I was like, oh my God, <laughs> leadership advice. If you... If you Google leadership advice, you get 2 million results. Like, what could I possibly say that adds yeah. value? And that's when it really, like, solidified for me, that light bulb idea. And I said, let me compare it to the writing process that – despite having been a chief innovation officer, here are five things I never knew until I wrote a book. 
Wow. And that, I gave each one of the five lessons and, and um, uh, a themed name. The story got shared online and I spoke at another company about it and I could feel people's responsiveness to the idea and taking like this abstract concept and making it accessible for people to then act. And so when I spoke again about it, because my business background, I like to make everything real, uh, take things out of the air and put them down. So I did an overview sheet and I named it, authorize it, think like a writer to win at work and life. <laughs> I said, I think I can replicate this uh, kind of speaking or workshop environment at other companies. And I created a workshop program that all came from writing Saturday's Child. This hmm. whole second book in a whole other genre. No kidding. Something yes. that I never saw coming came because I took that first step into the unknown. Otherwise, I would never have known what I know in order to do this. And the workshops, the pandemic, of course, affected us all. It, it gave me um, a few silver linings of time and space. And so I finished the book. I did the workshops. I started teaching all the workshops virtually. I've worked with many different companies. I work with universities, helping graduating seniors mm. shift perspective and live their best career story. And surprising for me, I'm a featured contributor for a government site for federal and state employees to help them shape the stories they need to tell. So this book is all about personal uh, narratives, how to find, own, and message your own story, business storytelling, how to shape and construct the stories that you need to tell at work, for success. And who should buy the book? Everybody who's working. In these transitioning times, and I'm, I'm saying that tongue in cheek, everything is changing. Every business is changing. Every business conversation is changing. The way we manufacture, distribute, invent a, a new product, market that product, uh, no matter what area of corporate life you're in, what department or division, or whether you're an entrepreneur or a solopreneur or a contract employee, whoever tells the best story wins. And I go into every workshop and wrote every page of this book with one thing in mind. I want the reader or the listener to win and be more successful than they were when they started to help them see something that they might not have seen before and live up to their career potential. That's my filter for everything I do now. So do you have a bumper sticker that says whoever tells the best story wins? I don't. But well, I think you need to get now. one. My thoughts just went, Wow. <laughs> because as I was thinking, and of course, as a writer, you don't realize that maybe you've always thought like a writer. Yes, in hindsight. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. I see that I have. I, it wasn't conscious. Exactly. Uh, before now. But, you know, writers do think a certain way. One takeaway for the listeners is that writers are quest centric. When you're writing a book and I, I use this example because it's something that everybody's seen. When Dorothy landed in the Wizard in in the Wizard of Oz, but landed in Oz and realized she wasn't in Kansas anymore, she wanted to go back. But if you stay mired in the problem, oh my God, I'm somewhere new and I'm not home, the story's not going to move forward. 
And that's what writers do. Writers are always in action modes. It's mm. action, reaction, and uh, the story has to continuously move forward. So instead of being problem-centric, there is always a problem to solve in every story, in every company, in every product. There's always a problem to solve. But you have to become quest centric on the solution of that problem, which sets Dorothy off to find the way home. So she goes off to find the wizard and, and just trots down the yellow brick road and all of it so that that story stays moving. Many of us um, at work get mired in the problem. Yes. And end up being, instead of defining the problem, we stick with the problem and we become, in some ways, against things that can solve the problem. But heroines or heroes of stories like the protagonist, Dorothy, have to always be for something. And that's a distinction, helps people to think about sometimes their, uh, their own uh, negativity. Uh, one of, uh, you know, very briefly, the, the five lessons are embrace the narrative arc. Work is nothing more than people on a collective quest. And there's, there's a pattern to an arc that everybody needs to understand that affects every single thing you do at work. The second lesson is understand your characters. You need to understand the people around you and who they are for you. And that even though you're the hero or the heroine of your own story, to them, you're a supporting character. You need to, you need to really grasp mm -hmm. that. And you need to understand your own inner journey and the character arc that you're on because we are so often in our own way. And when you're, when you're walking down the street and you see a shadow, that's caused by the obstacle that is you. Getting a handle on that in a way that's going to help your career is just a very important lesson in the book. And then the, the thir number three through five are welcome conflict. We, all, we always avoid it. Takes you to a higher level, just like antagonists. Seek the unconventional because the traditional mm -hmm. is no longer enough. And stepping into the unknown, which we touched on a little bit before. Right. Those are the five lessons. And in the book, after you absorb them, there are uh, storytelling tools and templates that will help you uh, shape what you're saying in a way to compel people to come along with you. Is this a a book that possibly might give us tips as well on how to raise our children in this respect? Well, I think, you know, the book is at work and life. Uh, each one of these lessons improves your relationships at home. So definitely reading the book through that lens, how do I take this and apply it to raising children to a help them think like writers but to think like a writer myself so that I can be an uber observer okay <laughs> and non-judgmental and that's a key to writers telling a story they have a a high level 40,000 foot view and they operate um, without judgment and I think that that being a parent myself yes that is uh, a lesson to learn for parenting hard to live up to but it's a it's a <laughs> it definitely something to think about I think that our listeners are going to have to listen to this twice because you just said so much that triggered all different types of thought processes that I never even thought about before you put them into words and obviously your book is going to be a guide I see it as mm -hmm. a guide and I was going to ask you if there were exercises you know that people can do but you already had answered that that yes there are with the templates there are throughout. Yes. that's incredible so 
we have got to get this message out there. And well, Carol, you, is... sa- you said um, to me once that the podcast led you into many new directions. And so uh, it was a pleasure to talk to you today. And if you feel that having a book discussion, it's a little different than having a podcast, but if you ever wanted to pull a group of people together who would read the book and then we could discuss it all, just like a traditional book club right, in a right. way. That's a great uh, idea. Reach out to me and I'd be, I'd be happy to participate because it's you. That's an incredible idea. And also along that same line, on your website, do you have any type of coaching that you do or help or anything like I that? Do not, I do not do uh, one-on-one coaching. Okay. There's just not enough bandwidth for for that. My, This is why I work with corporations and through them, their employees or with universities and through them, their students. And I work with groups because I, the message can touch more people that way. Right. So, but people could read, I mean, if somebody had a question, they can reach out to me on LinkedIn and, and, you know, uh, there's a contact form, of course, on the website. Uh, And maybe there are uh, many uh, groups uh, that, that want to, to form. Uh, I did uh, so many book clubs for the memoir for Saturday's Child, because that's how those kinds of books work. There aren't the same kind of book clubs for business books, but I think this one could break the mold and uh, it would be great to have workshops like that um, in a in kind of just like a gathering book clubby kind of format. I agree. And this has been really great. Just as you capsulized it when you said that you know they're two very different genres they're two very different types of books and yet the message well two different messages as well but they're both a challenge and I appreciate that and in the show notes there's going to be all the links that you can get in touch with Deborah that you can go to her website that you can connect with her on Facebook Instagram etc pick up the book share the book, both of them. I know that you'll enjoy them because it's a great story. And then to learn how to write and and live a story. Oh, that's just too exciting. <laughs> and, I think you know, it's the fantastic. second book is really for non-writers. I also yes. say in the book, which could be the bumper sticker on the other okay. side of the car, <laughs> you don't need to be a writer. Yes. You just need to think like one. We all are writing that down. You don't need to be a writer. You just need to think like one. On that note, I want to thank you for being on Never Ever Give Up Hope. This has been exciting and definitely stimulating. And we look forward to having you back. Oh, thank you so much, Carol. And uh, may all your stories be good ones. <laughs> Thank you for listening to Never Ever Give Up Hope featuring Carol Graham. Did you know that most people succeed because they are determined to? Quitting was never an option. Carol loves your comments and will respond to each one. So please subscribe and review this podcast. A rating of five stars would be outstanding and appreciated. Remember, if you are still here, there is always hope.